Um, here we are a few weeks into our series on prayer, and uh, we have been in this 40 days of prayer with the whole theme of all in. That's what that song was all about just now. I, I want to know God in a real way. I, I don't want to just know him academically. I don't want to know him as a historical figure. I want my heart to know him. I want to experience him. I want to be given over to his will. What we've been talking, I think that really the tension of this entire series has been this. Most all of us believe theoretically in the power of prayer. If you've been in church any time at all, you know you've heard Christians talk about how God answers prayer miraculously. You've heard sermon after sermon about how Jesus would spend all night in prayer to his Father, and that was the secret even of Jesus' power. We've heard stories about miracles with men like George Mueller and what God did on mission fields through men like Hudson Taylor and here in America through D.L. Moody and in Britain with Spurgeon and all those things about how God answers prayer. We believe in prayer academically, but then there's like our prayer life. I very seldom meet a Christian who feels contented in any way, shape, form, or fashion with their prayer life. To be honest, it's a struggle, isn't it? I think for a lot of us, we sort of don't know what to say. We don't know if we're asking for the right things. We don't know if we should expect what we're praying for to actually happen. So we tend to pray really vague, generic prayers for fear that we'll ask specifically and God won't answer and we'll lose hope. I think these are the kind of admissions that when we get real honest, this is the reason so many of us spend what is the national average of about seven minutes per day in prayer. This morning I want to entitle our time together, From Duty to Delight. I believe, listen, that's where God is calling our prayer life, to go from a sense of I don't really want to do this, I don't really understand it, I don't know how to do it, but it's my duty to so being filled with the fire of God that we can't not pray. All right, This is a little different setup than normal. I, I don't usually have all the paraphernalia. I told somebody I like never wanted to be a prop preacher. I never wanted to be that guy, right? And, and increasingly, I like drag stuff up here on the stage with me. Um, but I do want to do this this morning. I, I want us to get incredibly basic. And instead of talking about how to have a time with God, let's do it together. All right? Um, this morning... A couple of tools that you're going to need to go from duty to delight. And let me note before we go any further, as much as we strive to have a passion for prayer, let me just be honest with you, every great man and woman of God in history, I think, has admitted this. It's not always going to be a delight. Sometimes you're going to fight for a vision of God, and you're not going to receive it. Sometimes, as the ancients said, heaven will seem like it's brass, Right? You just won't feel like you're getting through it all. And, and the fact is, that doesn't mean you're abnormal. That means you're a human being in a fallen, sinful world. Okay? There's going to be times this thing is cold. And rather than have this profound sense of guilt and beat yourself up and what's wrong with me, you tell God all about it. You tell him you want a heart for him. And there comes a time when you wrap it up and you get some rest and the next day you come seek him again. But I believe far more often than we experience, God wants our prayer life to come from a place of delight. Here's what I want to encourage you to do in your prayer time, okay? These are some things that have revolutionized my prayer time. They're not original to me. I've stolen them from some of the greats in history. But I want to encourage you, start with a time and a place that's all yours, Okay, for me, that's my living room. There's a little ottoman there. I kneel beside that ottoman when I have my prayer time, not because I'm that holy, but because I'm that distractible. I have to get my face like six inches from the text without a lot of noise, without a lot of stuff. That's my time. Listen, for some of you, that space may be at lunch in your car. 
For some of you, that's a prayer closet. Some of you have told me after watching the movie Prayer Room, like you niched out a little place in a closet, and you're like, that's where I meet with God. It doesn't really matter the place. It doesn't really matter the posture. You don't have to pray like this. I don't, pr- frankly, I don't do it at a table. I do it kneeling. Some people have prayed standing. Some people have prayed at altars. God's not nearly as concerned about the posture or the place as he is about the fact that you have a place. And you have a time. You make an appointment. God, I'm going to meet with you tomorrow morning at 5. Like I was meeting with a dignitary. I wouldn't miss the meeting. It's too important. It's too critical. I've got to have my time. If it's in the morning, if it's in the evening, I've got to have my time with God. Once you've got a time and a place... You say, aren't we talking about prayer? Yeah. But this is going to go hand in hand with praying with passion. Start with a good study Bible. And here's the thing. I brought my study Bible. This Bible has become increasingly dear to me as I study out of it. um, We've given a lot of these away. Many of you have this. The ESV study Bible. I love the notes. I love the maps. The translation's a near literal translation, like our King James, like the New American Standard Version. For me, this is my study Bible. Okay, for some of you in the room, it's King James Bible, and you've got a good study Bible with maps and all that. Fantastic. Okay, but get a good study Bible and then get a good study plan. Where are you going to start? What are you going to read? If you don't know where to read, I'd recommend starting in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, For a lot of you who've gone through our Gospel class, we give out this little packet called the E100, the Essential 100 Bible Reading Plan. Literally, this will walk you from Genesis to Revelation, hitting all the high points of Scripture. If you don't have a plan and you've never read the Bible through, it's a great place to start. We'll give you one of these. If you ask for one at the Welcome Center, we'll sign you up and get you one. If you don't have a good study Bible and right now is a tough time, you can't afford it, tell them back at the Welcome Center. We'll get you one of these. Here's the other thing you need. A pen, something to write on. And then it's whatever accruedments you like, man. I'm going to have some coffee when I read. I'm going to have a candle when I read because I do a little chant. But no, I don't do that. But I, I have a candle because for some reason I have trouble focusing. And there's something about the smell. There's something about the light that just calms me down and helps me focus. I don't, I don't assign any tremendous spiritual significance to it other than that's something special I do. What do you do that calms you that's a special thing between you and God? Okay, you've got all these things. Now I want to encourage you, before you open the Bible, here's what we've been learning, and man, it's a well-guarded secret. Some of the greatest prayers in the history of the church learned a valuable lesson in our conversation with God, let him start talking first. I think for a lot of us, our experience has been we kneel down, God, I've come before you today. I want to talk to you. Thank you for your goodness. I I pray that we try to go through acts, um, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, right? And we find ourselves distracted. It takes us 20 minutes just to tune our heart in enough where we can actually talk to him. There is a powerful thing when you let God talk to you first through the word. That will begin the conversation in a far more powerful way in my experience. So here's the thing, you pray a little 30 second prayer for the Holy Spirit of God who wrote this book to open your heart eyes. You ever heard that little song we sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. That's taken right out of Ephesians and the idea is, listen, you can experience the living God. You, may, you won't see him with physical eyes, but you can see him with your heart. You're saying, God, I want to see you. I want to know you. Can we pray that before we open God's word? Father, before we open your word today and learn what it is to go from duty to delight in seeking your face, Would you take this text right now? We don't want to make a game out of this. We don't want to make some little show out of this. Lord, this is your word. Take it. Fill our heart with it. Speak to us today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 
Take your Bibles, turn to Mark 10, 35. We're going to put these up on the screen. Um, shouldn't be a whole big difference between translations here. I've got the verses from my Bible here today, Mark 10, 35. So if you just want to look on, that's fine. This is just purely, I'm doing a through the Bible in a year plan. Okay, so this is one of my recent readings. I'm reading through the Old Testament a few chapters a day. I'm reading through the New Testament a few chapters a day. This is just a random text taken from my devotional time, all right? Could be anything. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Let's look at this together. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Some of you know what that means so far. If you were to read in your study Bible notes, it would tell you. They're saying, when when you come into your kingdom, we want to be prominent. We want to be on the right hand and the left hand of you. And Jesus said, Can you drink the cup of suffering that I'm going to have to drink? They don't understand he's talking about suffering, that there's a cross before the crown. They say, we're able. And Jesus says, you're you're going to drink that cup of suffering soon. But to put you on my right hand and my left hand, that's not mine to give. That's the Father's. Okay? Look at this. Verse 41. When the ten heard it, the ten other disciples, they began to be indignant at James and John. How dare you guys? And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now here's the thing, for some of you, you'll be reading along in a text like that, and you won't have to do any process, God will start like pouring that on, and you'll feel him talking to you about something in your life, that's fantastic. But here's what I want to encourage you to do first, think the truth out. Unpack this text a little bit in your mind. Get down into the meat of what it's saying and what it's teaching. I've come across a method very recently that I love. It's one of probably 300, but it's good. You have a little insert in your bulletin, right, with a little sword on it? If you want to grab that out of your bulletin right now and take a look, some of you are like, I didn't get a bulletin, or I threw my bulletin away. Look on with somebody near you. You could draw this. It's super simple. You'll notice on this there's just a sword drawn to speak of the Word of God compared to a two-edged sword. Above the sword it says God, question mark. Below the sword it says people, question mark. God's the tip of the sword, y'all. People is where we hold on to the sword that is God's Word. 
And then there's three letters. S, P on one blade, E, C on the other. Here's what that stands for. It's questions. In this text, is there a sin to avoid? That's the S. Is there a sin to avoid? The E, excuse me, the P, is there a promise to claim? The E, is there an example to follow? And then the C, is there a command to obey? Let me stop just a minute. I, I hear people say all the time, like, man, I, I, I read the word and I just don't get anything out of it. Friend, it may be you're not questioning it enough like this. Here's the real problem. Can, can we be honest? We're in church. Can we be honest? Say amen. A lot of us are like, I can't do that in three minutes. And that's all the time I really have for the Lord. Three minutes. Let me just note this. Listen, I, oh man, today's not Brian pummels you day, right? By the way, youth, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I mean? There's a little side reference in our sermon yesterday. Um, it's a beautiful thing if you're doing this much and you do a little more. A little more can make a profound difference. But friend, listen, you don't become a great golfer by playing two minutes a day. You don't become an intellectual scholar by opening a book two minutes a day. Anything worth doing, anything that's going to grab hold of your life and start a fire is going to take a little time. So when you get down and start thinking the truth out, I literally, I just wrote what I found on my paper. The first thing, what does this teach me about God? You know what it taught me, verse 45? That Jesus Christ serves. He didn't have to, he's God. He came to serve. You know what it taught me? That Jesus hears our desperate cries, verse 49, and he cares. Everybody else is like, shut that dude up. We don't want to hear from him. He can't bring anything to the table. Look how poor he is. He's that beggar. We don't have anything to do with him. You know who did notice? You know who did hear? Jesus. Jesus hears. And Jesus cares. You know what else I caught? He wants to help. God wants to heal. I'm, I didn't catch this till a little bit into my study. Verse 36, what do you want me to do for you, disciples? Verse 51, what do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? He didn't get on to him for asking. You greedy so-and-so, how dare you take up my time asking. You know what? He loves it when we ask. I learned that about God again, reading that. Okay, down at the bottom section, what can we learn about people? You know what I took from this passage? We often want promotion without pain. Verse 37, God, I want to be blessed. God, I want to move forward. But God, I don't want to suffer. I want to grow, but I don't want to grow if it means going through that. It, it comes back to one of those comments I've heard 10,000 times where people tell us, don't pray for patience, God will give you trouble. Really? Don't pray to be like Jesus, God might hurt you. Don't pray for God's intention for your life, you might endure some pain. We want it so easy. Here's the second thing. We often misjudge greatness, verses 42 through 45. Jesus said, you know what, among you, you think it's great when you're the boss and you're throwing out commands and you're telling people, go here, do that. He said, that's not greatness. Here's the last thing I got. We often judge the weak and helpless harshly. 
How often when somebody's different, when somebody's dirty, when somebody's on the side of the road and they can't do anything to benefit us or make us look better, do we dismiss them? And once I hit the SPEC, it started getting a little personal. Is there a sin to avoid in this text? You know what I saw in that? The sin of domineering, manipulative leadership. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manipulate you, husband, into doing what I want. I'm going mani- to manipulate you, kids, into giving me what you ought to. At work, I'm going to be hard, I'm going to be tough, I'm going to grind so I get my way. Jesus said, that's a sin, don't do that. Here's another sin to avoid. Dismissing, avoiding, or mocking people that Jesus loves. Is there a promise to claim? Jesus said if, in verse 43 and 44, if you want to be great, be a servant. I love that. He said it's not wrong to want to be great. If you're here and you feel like I want to be great, I want to do something profound, I want to see my life accomplish great things, Jesus says, come on, be great. Be a servant. That's a promise. You want to be great? He'll make you great. Be a servant. Here's another promise. Jesus says to Bartimaeus, your faith has healed you. You know what? Faith changes things. When we dare to trust God, when we dare to trust God, when we dare to trust God, he will do more than you can possibly imagine. How about an example to follow? Jesus In verses 42 and 45, being a servant, taking the lowest place. He's God, but he's not ashamed to get on his knees and wash their feet, right? But you know the other one that hit me like a ton of bricks? You know who who else's example I want to follow? Bartimaeus. Jesus, help me. Shut up, we don't want to hear from you. I don't care, Jesus, help me. I'm not putting on a front. I'm not trying to convince you that the Facebook me is the real me. I'm banged up and I'm hurt and Jesus, I need help and I'm not ashamed to ask for it. God, I want to be like that, don't you? How about a command to obey? Verse 42 and 43, Jesus is telling us, I want you to follow me and be a servant like I am. Your life in yours come do what I did, be a servant. Y'all, how long did that take what we just did, five minutes? But here's the thing, what we just did is we thought through the truth. Once you think the truth out, oh, listen to me, think the truth in. Before you start praying, there's a bridge between Bible study and prayer, and you know what it is? It's called meditation. It is putting yourself in the text. Because now i got to get real personal with Brian. Lord, you know that sometimes as a pastor of this church, it's my desire to just be celebrated and loved and not to serve. God, forgive me when I've been manipulative. Forgive me when I've ignored somebody or tried to punish somebody. Forgive me when I've dropped in little hints about how holy I am so they'll think better of me. What about dismissing, avoiding, or mocking people Jesus loves? God, do you feel that on you? I feel that with me. How prone we are to do, how prone I am to do that. What about this? Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to cry out like Bartimaeus, but you know how often I'm so worried about my reputation. I get cocky and I think I can handle it and I can't handle it. And then it gets real personal. God, help me with Jenny. Help me to be a better husband. 
help, help me to, to stop being so obstinate and to actually serve her instead of trying to be served by her. God, help me with my kids that there's things I see in them that I don't like and instead of just trying to manipulate them and change them, God, I want to serve them and love them and pray for them. Friends, here's what's happening. You are taking the truth from your head to your heart. And it will start lighting your heart on fire. Or it won't. Here's the third thing. Think the truth out. Think the truth in through meditation. Turn the heart up. Okay? We're real close to praying now. Because you're going to be in a mode of either enjoying Jesus or crying out to him. You're going to be in the mode like, God, I feel moved that, Jesus, you're so good to me. Thank you that you came to serve me. Thank you, Lord, that you're working in my life, and I want to be great, and you're going to make me great because I'm going to be a servant. God, you right? Either you're enjoying him, feeling his presence, and prayer becomes like spontaneous, or you say, God, forgive me. I still, I don't feel you today. I want to. Give me a heart to have you. You know what? Sometimes you're going to pray that, and just the praying it passionately is going to ignite your passions and your emotions. Sometimes it's not going to happen. And you're going to say, God, thank you that even on days when I don't feel it, even on days when it's cloudy, the sun is still shining, and Lord, I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) So here's the thing. Once your heart is engaged, or once you've admitted that your heart isn't as engaged as it needs to be, you're ready to pray. And what do you pray for? Whatever you want. What do you pray for? Whatever you want, whatever comes to mind, whoever comes to mind. You don't, listen, whenever I go in too linear, like it has to be, right? And here's the thing. I've gone in before and tried to do the deal of, here, here's the, the common exponents of prayer. Adoration, thanksgiving, confession, repentance, petition, supplication, intercession. Those are traditionally what's included in prayer. For me, trying to go in, this may not be you, and spell out the elements and, okay, God, first I come with praises. Thank you for being so good to me. And now I come with confession. Forgive me. For me, that cools me down. But this morning, I want to give you three principles, and we're done, by way of a metaphor (laughs) that are just a guideline for your prayer. Once your heart's heated up, pray whatever you want, but here's three guidelines for prayer, and here's our definition. Prayer is a continual conversation between a loving father and a helpless child. You want to know what prayer is? That's it. You want to picture in your heart what prayer is? A continual conversation between a loving father and his helpless child. So here's three things to remember. Don't forget, first of all, awe. Remember who you're talking to. You want to pray right? Just remember who you're talking to. This is a quote from an ancient Christian (laughs) <laughs> no, you know what? That's not true. I don't want to make stuff up up here. This is a quote from some time back, maybe not ancient. I read something ancient, and it never made the notes. This is just old. Here's what they said when they started their prayer time. God is here. Within these walls, before me, behind me, on my right hand, on my left hand, he who fills immensity has come down to me here. I'm now about to bow at his feet and speak to him. I can pour forth my desires before him, and not one syllable from my lips will escape his ear. I can speak to him as I would to the dearest friend I have on earth. I'm telling you, when you come before him and you're like, God, you, I like to pray, Lord, the one in control of supernovas and atoms. Every speck of sand and every galaxy 
all at the same time. You created it and you sustain it. God, thank you that you're in the room with me closer than the air I breathe right now. And you hear it all. Thank you that you're so high and holy I couldn't possibly come before you. But you're my Father and I love you. And you love me so I come. Right? All. Oh. Remember who you're talking to. Here's the second thing, and it's quite simply helplessness. Remember what you are. How many of our people growing up at Calvary sat in these little chairs? I have the little Aubrey chair over my office. They saved it for me. The one that, that she came up in, right, sitting in. She's up there like, dad, talking about it, quit. Um, you know where our problem comes on is when we start thinking, I'm not this, I'm better than this, I'm bigger... No, you're not. No, I'm not. You know what I have to remember when I come before this one in prayer? I'm so banged up, it's ridiculous. I'm so selfish. I will love everything in the world besides Jesus. I love a video game more than I love Jesus. I love a meal more than I love Christ. I love the cowboys when they're winning more than I love Jesus. God, I'm broken, Please, and, I, and I'm saved. I'm his, but I'm still broken. God, I'm coming to you like a child. Align me with your purposes, right? What are you doing? Remember who he is. Remember what you are. And then this is one of my favorites. Grace, remember to come in Jesus' name. Here's the way we were taught to pray in church, right? Now make sure, make sure before you close that prayer, say, in Jesus' name, amen. That's what makes it count, right? And so we've made that sort of a little tag on at the end of a prayer. I'm not mocking that. I'm just saying that really isn't the intention when he said pray in Jesus' name for us to say, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay? Here's what Tim Keller said I think is very good. To pray in Jesus' name is not meant to be a magic formula as if the pronunciation of the words coerces God's power or mechanically taps into supernatural forces. Jesus' name is shorthand for his divine person and saving work. To come to the Father in Jesus' name, not our own, is to come fully cognizant that we are being heard because of the costly grace in which we stand. I'm telling you, this will change your prayer time when you say, Lord, I can't come and ask for anything because I deserve it, but because Jesus died for me, my sins are gone. Because Jesus rose for me, his goodness is mine. So God, I come through that torn veil and I pray boldly because I'm coming in Jesus' name. That's what allows you to have this conversation. That's what allows you to be confident that he hears you. That's what allows you to be confident that he will either answer or he will give you something better than you asked. These are all tools this morning. I want to ask you today, What does your relationship with God look like? I'm talking to you. Individually. If I could sit down and us fill up some coffee mugs and sit across the table from each other and I could put a hand out on your arm and say, tell me about your time with Jesus. What does it look like? Where does it happen? And is it a duty? Distasteful, boring, hard, sometimes it is. Or increasingly, is it becoming a delight? My friends, listen to me. This thing called Christianity, this is what our young people are learning. It is driven by the engine of a relationship with God. And when you don't have that, it goes flat, it goes cold, it becomes traditions, it becomes legalisms, it becomes dead, it becomes judgmental, it becomes lifeless. How long has it been? 
since you came into the presence of a living God and he moved you to tears. How long has it been since he laid his finger on that thing in your life and said, I love you. I want you to deal with this. I want you to give me this. I want you to open up that tight grip, that white knuckled grip and let me have it. Let me have them. Let me do it. How long has it been? You had a passion to share a Christ who was talking to you personally. 